Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, a blockade comes down, an energy project goes away, and a court ruling muddies the waters. I don't know why the government of Canada has been unable to get its act together. New pressures on the government, so what's the plan? Guilty on two charges. What it means for Harvey Weinstein's future. To me, that just looked like completely fabricated figures. Some lessons learned from China's response to the coronavirus outbreak. And the emergency goalie whose 15 seconds ain't over yet. I actually grabbed the guy beside me who I don't even know. I said to him, I'm like, that's my husband. Just wait till you see how his kids react to seeing dad on TV. This is The National. Well, tonight on the ground, in the boardroom, and from the courts, Canada's deep divisions exposed over the future of energy projects and the threat of climate change. Ontario police took the first major step today to clear protests blocking rail traffic, protests aimed at a natural gas pipeline worth billions to B.C. Demonstrators denounced the police action, while others celebrated a victory for environmentalists. Tech Resources has pulled the plug on a $20 billion oil sands mine in Alberta, snuffing out hopes for thousands of jobs. Also today, Alberta's top court has ruled against the federal carbon tax, a major win for the government there. These files are moving fast, and we're going to get you to all of it. So let's start in eastern Ontario, where a key rail blockade was cleared away this morning. Once again, Olivia Stefanovic was on the scene when it all went down. About eight hours after a midnight deadline to clear out a Mohawk camp, a convoy of police vehicles moved in to do the job themselves. Guys, can we just get to step over for a second? The demonstrators expected this, and though they had called for backup overnight and tried to stand their ground, they were quickly outnumbered. You guys, you need to leave now. Oh, you you ask you to leave? leave? You're actually past the, you need to leave now. You're on sovereign territory, every single one of you, unseated, every single one of you. Cell phone video captures the moment clashes erupted by the tracks. Provincial police say one person with minor injuries left by ambulance. Ten people face charges, including mischief and resisting arrest. Even in the back of an offender truck, their voices rang out in defiance. After that midnight deadline, Mohawks say they negotiated for a peaceful resolution into the early morning until police said all avenues had been exhausted. It was like a pit in the bottom of my stomach. I just felt sick. I didn't feel safe. I still don't feel safe now in my own community. Still, some demonstrators plan to stay, even after the snowplow that had anchored their camp was hauled away. 19 days ago, it was parked there in support of some hereditary chiefs in B.C. who oppose a natural gas pipeline. I'm just going to stay here for as long as it takes for the RCMP to get out. It's time for Canada to know what it's like to be invaded. This evening, the first CN train rolled through Tyendinaga again. In response, some Mohawks threw tires on the tracks. There remains a heavy police presence here, and parts of the camp are still coming down. But the Mohawks say this could be far from over. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Tyendinaga, Ontario. And now to a new issue dividing Canadians tonight. Tech Resources' decision to scrap a massive oil sands project over what it calls Canada's incoherent environmental policy. Some question whether the project made economic sense, but others put the blame squarely on the Prime Minister. Salima Shivji has the details. A protest taking over Parliament Hill, spelling out the challenges coming to a head for the Trudeau Liberals as they struggle to balance reconciliation, climate action, and new energy projects. All of which played into the death of the proposed Tech Frontier oil sands mine. There is no constructive path forward. The project has landed squarely at the nexus of a much broader national discussion. The suggestion that Ottawa and Alberta need to work out their competing visions for how to move ahead with resource projects. But he didn't mention another economic reality, that the price of oil has tanked since the project was first proposed. 
in Ottawa, where the looming cabinet decision on tech was dividing the Liberals. It's a relief for me that the company was the one that took the decision. Relief, since it saves many MPs from explaining how approving the mine would fit with the Liberals' climate priorities. But no relief from accusations of letting Alberta down and risking national unity. What else was Tech Frontier supposed to do to get a project built in this country, Mr. Speaker? Does this Prime Minister want Alberta in Canada or not? The world is changing. That You can no longer build a strong economy if you are not fighting climate change at the same time. Alberta's Premier is fuming, blaming Ottawa for dragging its feet and forcing the company's hand. And I don't know why the government of Canada has been unable to get its act together on these issues. And so the challenge for the Trudeau Liberals intensifies. How to soothe fears in Alberta that climate concerns won't entirely sacrifice resource jobs. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, politics aside, losing the Frontier Project does cut deep for many Albertans. It promised thousands of high-paying jobs that in turn could support local businesses. But that's now gone. And as Carolyn Dunn found out, for those who stood to benefit, it is a bitter pill to swallow. The lunch hour rush at this Fort McMurray Steakhouse isn't much of a rush at all. Owner Mike DeRoche says he's operating at about 35% staffing levels just to stay open. TechMine represented something both real and symbolic. Hope. One word, hope. I mean, it is looking at restoring the confidence in the economy. That's gone, at least temporarily, along with all the jobs that TechMine was supposed to bring. For a place that has felt the double gut punch of slumping oil prices and a dearth of investment, some point to a bigger message. Canada is not a good place to do business and, uh, and it's not balanced out between climate change and uh, getting your people on the ground to work. The government can't deal with the people, with the, with the problems we got here. They can't make a decision on anything. What about the concerns about the environment and about Indigenous rights? And I think that's all important stuff, but people need to work. Ron Quintal just saw 10 years of planning disappear in an instant. I felt like as if we were robbed of something. The Fort Mackay Métis Nation was one of 14 Indigenous communities to sign an agreement with TechMine. My first reaction was, this is going to cripple the region. This is going to cripple the province, the country. So Quintal is calling for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney and TechMine officials to come back to the table with Indigenous leaders. A new table to forge a new way forward. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Fort McMurray, Alberta. On the heels of that economic blow, the Alberta government managed a victory. The province's Court of Appeal has ruled 4-1 to one against the federal carbon tax. We agree with the need to reduce emissions uh, across our economy and in our energy sector. But we must be allowed to do it our own way. The ruling says the federal tax intrudes on provincial jurisdiction and opens the door to unlimited interference by Ottawa. Ontario and Saskatchewan mounted similar legal battles against the carbon tax, but they lost in court. So a lot of moving parts today. This is why we need to bring in our chief political correspondent, Rosie. What should the federal government really be taking away from this, I, I, I suppose, beginning with that court decision? Well, it's a victory, Adrian, for Alberta and really anyone who's fundamentally against carbon taxes, of course. But the Supreme Court is going to hear all of these arguments next month. It's interesting, though, that the support for climate pricing was part of Tech Frontier's letter explaining why it was walking away from that $20 billion oil sands project. And that letter also pointed to what it calls this country's failure to sort out how to develop resources and fight climate change. That's something, as you know, the Prime Minister has said for years has to happen together. The rejection of this project sort of forces him to have to answer some tough questions about how that is going to work moving forward. Does it mean big energy projects like this one won't happen in this country? Does it mean the federal government has to be more aggressive on climate change? Or do provincial governments like Alberta just have to get on board? We know the budget expected towards the end of next month is supposed to be framed around climate change uh, and perhaps a transition from a resource economy to a green economy. So that too may offer us some answers. Okay, so we know Canadians have been sort of hanging on to the details of, of each of these stories, but when you put them together, how big of a problem could this be for the government? 
It's it's fascinating the way this has happened over the past few weeks. Three of the Liberal government's top priorities have collided, energy, the environment, and reconciliation with Canada's Indigenous peoples. And the government is really trying to find a way to reconcile all three of those priorities, and they don't always align. Some of it has required some short-term solutions to deal with immediate problems, the blockades, for instance, to try and get the economy moving again. But much of this is a longer-term project, particularly on those Indigenous issues, where it's really presenting itself as an opportunity to right some much bigger wrongs around land, treaties, self-governance agreements, something the government has been working on. But not every First Nation in this country is at the same place in terms of taking that on, which means we may see more of these kinds of flashpoints until the bigger issues are resolved. All right, Rosie, as always, thank you. Thanks, Adrian. To New York now, where after five days of jury deliberations, Harvey Weinstein is in custody, convicted today of two sex crimes. The disgraced Hollywood producer was found guilty of a criminal sexual act in the first degree and rape in the third degree. But he was acquitted of being a sexual predator. Stephen D'Souza was in the courtroom. Harvey Weinstein arrived in court, a fallen titan of Hollywood. By midday, he was let out in handcuffs, a convicted sexual offender and rapist. Weinstein, with his manipulation, his resources, his attorneys, his publicists, and his spies, did everything he could to silence the survivors. But they refused to be silent. The jury believed Miriam Haley that Weinstein forced himself on her in 2006. The jury also believed that Weinstein raped Jessica Mann, but not that he physically forced her, resulting in the lesser conviction of third-degree rape. It's not any longer going to be business as usual. In other words, you can get away with whatever you want to do to women, and rationalize it, and justify it, because women are going to speak up. And now that they've broken through their fear, it's a new day. The jury looked past the defense focus on the victim's consensual relationships with Weinstein, a sign lawyers say that victims of sexual misconduct are gaining more power in the justice system. The Me Too movement has educated us all about how pervasive this kind of behavior it is and how unacceptable it is. But the jury was unable to accept Annabella Shiora's accusation that Weinstein raped her more than 25 years ago. That's why Weinstein wasn't convicted of the most serious charge of predatory sexual assault. He didn't cry, he didn't break down, he wasn't sobbing. He was more in a state of disbelief. He just said, I'm, and he just kept repeating, but I'm innocent, but I'm innocent. How could this happen in America, but I'm innocent. The result is bittersweet for model Amber Gutierrez. Five years ago, she went to New York police with accusations against Weinstein, but facing pressure from the producer's lawyers, the district attorney never pressed charges. I was uh, jumping for joy. <laughs> like, this is the, really the outcome I was wishing for. Okay, so Stephen, you were, of course, in the packed courtroom for the verdict. What was that like? Well, it was interesting because it was packed, it was deadly silent, but then there was a moment of extra suspense and added anticipation when the clerk read out the charge. The foreman didn't realize that was his cue to actually say the verdict, and so everybody leaned forward in anticipation, and then once he did, there were audible gasps in the courtroom. Harvey Weinstein was then led out in handcuffs, taken to a medical facility because his team argues that he still needs medical treatment for failed back surgery from back in December. Mm, and this whole saga is still far from over, right? That's right. He's back on March 11th for sentencing. He faces sentences anywhere from a minimum of five years to a maximum of 25. And his legal team says they have plenty of avenues to appeal. Meanwhile, there are still charges in L.A. Two women have accusations there, including one who testified here. And so that is still left to play out. Stephen D'Souza, thanks very much. You're welcome. A seventh case of coronavirus has been confirmed in B.C. Health officials say the man in his 40s got the infection in Canada and that he was in close contact with patient number six who had traveled to Iran. So there were a few additional close contacts that he had that have now been identified over the weekend and are also in isolation. Add to the B.C. patients Ontario's four cases and the total number of Canadians diagnosed with COVID-19 is now at 11. Some other countries, though, are seeing a sudden spike in cases and on entirely different continents. Still, as the CBC's Christine Birak tells us, the World Health Organization is not calling this a pandemic. Does this virus have pandemic potential? Absolutely, it has. Are we there yet? 
From our assessment, not yet. A pandemic is the worldwide spread of a new disease. Based on the cases we know about, South Korea is now the most coronavirus-stricken country outside of China. Italy has been caught off guard by a surge in cases, now emptying its historic streets. And the death count is rising in Iran, and the virus is spreading beyond its borders. Still, COVID-19 isn't considered worldwide yet. But the Canadian head of the WHO's crisis team in China says if because governments don't act fast, it will here. become a pandemic. Every day we stop to think about this disease and make decisions, should we do it or we not, this virus will take advantage and almost double the number of cases. To stop the spread, countries should be testing and identifying infections, isolating and treating sick patients, as well as those they've been in contact with. We've now seen spread into places like Iraq and in Kuwait. This infectious disease specialist says China's quarantines did help the world by slowing the virus down. That lead time has been beneficial for us to get ourselves organized, to prepare our hospitals and our health care system. Experts say if Canada can contain this virus for another six weeks or until the end of flu season, that will free up medical staff and hospital beds for COVID-19 patients going forward. It is very important that we shift our focus to our domestic situation. Canadian airports will soon be warning all travellers and tourists if they've been to any affected country and feel sick, they should self-isolate and call ahead before going into a doctor's office or hospital. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Christine mentioned Italy was caught off guard. This COVID-19 coronavirus emerged there on Friday. Now, more than 220 people are confirmed infected and seven have died, most of them elderly. As Rene Filipponi shows us, Italy now has the highest number of cases outside Asia. Police blocked the way in and out of nearly a dozen towns across northern Italy. This is the first major outbreak in Europe and the lockdown is an attempt to stop it from spreading. This officer says they are following instructions, blocking roads and asking people not to leave their homes. Behind the barricades are mostly empty streets. Fear is keeping many inside. Some venture out, only to line up for masks, which are limited in supply. The concern goes beyond Italy's borders. A train was stopped traveling to Austria because two passengers had a fever. It turned out not to be the coronavirus. The World Health Organization has sent a team to Italy. It's about good communication between states. It's about management and early detection of cases and their appropriate isolation and treatment. Uh, it's not about shutting borders. It's very difficult to understand exactly how and why these infections spread. This expert says it's unclear why Italy has seen this outbreak, adding there is no clear evidence yet. Community-wide lockdowns are the solution. We know it transmits face-to-face, -face, social contact, a cough, a sneeze, and we know that it also transmits in hospital settings. But we just don't know what it does in the community. The risk has driven authorities to cut short events like the Venice Carnival and close major tourist venues across the region. In Milan, grocery store shelves are near empty as residents stockpile in case the virus spreads and more lockdowns are ordered. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Now, this outbreak started in China, but one question. Could decisions made there in its early days have affected how it has spread around the world? We're going to dig into that a little later in the program. The federal government has unveiled plans to give more Canadians access to a medically assisted death. Nearly 300,000 people contributed to public consultations around the issue. Catherine Cullen shows us what the government is proposing. It might sound cliche to say, oh, I think of that person every day, but I really do think of her every day. Jack Hopkins says his grandmother Josephine's decision to have a medically assisted death gave her some control at the end of her life, but it also spurred him to become politically engaged on the issue. We realized afterwards, we said, you know, she was incredibly lucky, my granny, to, to get assisted dying um, because of certain vague criteria. Now the federal government is proposing changes to the law. 
we want to sincerely reduce the suffering that people are going through. Forced by a court decision, the government now says Canadians shouldn't have to be nearing death to get a doctor's help to die. We think we've opened, uh, we have opened access uh, sufficiently. But if someone is not already close to death, the proposed law would require them to go through a 90-day assessment period and be seen by an expert in their condition. The government also wants to relax the rules for people who are reasonably close to death. They want to drop the current 10-day reflection period and prevent circumstances like Audrey Parker's. But the law has forced me to play a cruel game of chicken. She had a medically assisted death sooner than she wanted because she feared she'd lose the mental capacity to consent. No one should be faced with such an impossible choice. The proposal is cheered by those who launched the court challenge to change the law. With their lawyer today saying he's proud to see the legislation. But some worry it's too permissive. And I think that even one death uh, that's unnecessary uh, is, is, is a big loss for our country. The government is facing a ticking clock here imposed by the courts, all while knowing that the stakes are significant. Since the laws were changed already, more than 13,000 Canadians have had a medically assisted death. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. By chance, do you have questions about medical assistance in dying? We'd like to put them to the decision makers in a special national conversation. Email us at thenational at cbc.ca or reach out to us on Instagram at CBC The National. Well, once again tonight, we are on the front lines of the fight against human trafficking. One of the biggest things is actually refusing housekeeping. Up next, we're with hotel workers as they learn what to watch for and how to help. It's an eye-opener. Justin Bieber dethrones Elvis Presley, but what does it take to break a record in the age of streaming? Reaching out to your fans is great, but then getting them to try to manipulate the system is a whole other thing. And what's it like when dad goes from Zamboni driver to NHL goalie overnight? We're all really lucky that we have him as a dad. Their reaction to his big TV appearance. We're back in two minutes. Justin Bieber's new album, Changes, is a chart topper. Nothing new for him. But this time it's a record breaker as well. Deanna Sumanak Johnson looks at how he helped fans help him get there. Yeah, you got that yummy, yum, that yummy, yum, yum. It may be too soon to call Justin Bieber the king. Let's go on a moonlight swim. But he did just dethrone Elvis Presley as the youngest artist with a seventh number one album on Billboard. That's just an incredible amount of music for somebody who's 25 years old to put out. Um, not to mention that it has all topped the charts. Um, so that's an impressive milestone. Today, Billboard counts streams as well as sales to determine the album's position on the chart. And it's easier to click than to go to the store. Still, Bieber's new album, unlike his last one, isn't critically acclaimed. I wasn't blown away by it at first, just because nothing really matched the explosiveness of the singles on purpose. Is it too late now to say sorry? But Bieber and his team worked hard on making sure the pop star was hard to ignore, starring in his own documentary YouTube series. I'm Justin. I am from Stratford, Ontario, Canada. Dancing with toddlers on late night television. And finally, promoting his album on TikTok, the new social media platform popular with teens. Justin essentially created his TikTok account on the day that his single Yummy came out. And then he just started hammering videos, asking fans to reuse the sound, the song, to create more and more videos. Some of Bieber's campaigning for number one was controversial, like telling fans on how to maximize the number of streams. Take this one for Spotify. Play it at a low volume, let it play while you sleep. Reaching out to your fans is great, but then getting them to try to manipulate the system is a whole other thing. If I can dream. Though that is something Elvis's longtime manager, Colonel Tom Parker, just might have tried himself. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Here are some of the other stories we're watching tonight. The Ontario government has brought the royal anthem back to Queen's Park, sparking anger from some in the legislature. 
For me, singing the God Save the Queen is a celebration of a hurtful and violent colonial past. I cannot be part of it. Procedural changes mean God Save the Queen will be sung in the legislature on the first Monday of each month. Some members refuse to do that today. BC's public inquiry on money laundering kicked off today. The inquiry will look at how criminal activity was allowed to flourish in the province. Previous reports detailed the extent of the problem, $7 billion laundered in 2018. More hearings are scheduled for later in the year. A final report is expected by May of 2021. And police in Germany are investigating after a man intentionally plowed his car into a carnival parade. 30 people were injured, a third of them children. The 29-year-old driver was arrested at the scene. Police say his motive remains unclear. Well, up next, a closer critical look at China's response to the coronavirus outbreak. I can't think of any substance you could spray on an open street um, in the manner that's depicted that would have any impact on a virus at all. As some question China's reaction. We look at what could be learned from this epidemic. I actually grabbed the guy beside me who I don't even know, and um, I said to him, I'm like, that's my husband. And we talk with the family of the Canadian Zamboni driver turned NHL goalie, now full-fledged celebrity. All that still to come tonight. Welcome back. Returning to one of our top stories, the World Health Organization is warning that while the COVID-19 outbreak is not a global pandemic yet, it could become one. There have been more than 2,000 cases outside of China, 11 of them here in Canada. Terence McKenna now on China's response and the lessons learned. This was the scene on the evening of January 24th in China. The Chinese New Year is celebrated by an astonishing television spectacular featuring thousands of singers and dancers promoting the accomplishments of the country and the Communist Party. But this was four days after news of the COVID-19 outbreak, and so a section was added at the last minute focusing on the unfolding epidemic in the city of Wuhan. TV presenters cheered on the brave healthcare workers confronting the deadly COVID-19 virus. All this was quite a marked departure from how the epidemic was treated weeks earlier when it was covered up by the Chinese authorities. Now infectious disease experts around the world are focusing on the lessons of the COVID-19 epidemic. Xi Jinping is the most powerful leader China has had since Mao Zedong. The entire Chinese bureaucracy and security apparatus seeks to please him and reinforce his highest announced priority, stability. Pulitzer Prize winning author Lori Garrett specializes in public health and infectious diseases. In China, she saw the SARS epidemic covered up by the Communist Party. So it's created a culture inside China of cover-up, lying, hiding the truth, um, very much like what I experienced in the old Soviet Union, where, you know, everybody wants to please the higher-ups. Garrett was working in China through that outbreak 17 years ago, when the government was notoriously dishonest about every aspect of it. She saw the same thing happening this time after the outbreak was first acknowledged on December 31st. They announce officially from the city government, there seems to be a bit of a problem. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We have it well under control. It has nothing whatsoever to do with SARS. Everybody remain calm. The People's Daily official newspaper ignored the announced outbreak on January 1st. In fact, there was no mention of the epidemic for 20 consecutive days through January 20th. Dr. Jen Jun Kuang is an infectious disease expert at the Council on Foreign Relations. It was interpreted in a way that uh, this is nothing serious, you know, that uh, uh, is not going to lead to efficient human-to-human -human transmission, you know, so 
uh, there was a lack of effective response to the outbreak at the local level. When an outbreak occurs, the time to respond is as early as possible. When you have a handful of human cases, when you actually can figure out John gave it to Mary, who gave it to Susie, who gave it to Paul. The response was exactly the opposite. Almost a third of Chinese city dwellers eat wild animals. This is how novel viruses jump from animals to humans. The SARS epidemic was eventually traced to the consumption of a small raccoon-like creature called a civet. The number one suspect in this epidemic is the pangolin, an anteater-like animal that is consumed because of its supposed healing qualities for many diseases. The first outbreak of COVID-19 was traced to the live animal market in Wuhan that was quickly shut down. Today, the government ordered live animal markets closed nationwide. Kelly Lee is an infectious disease expert at Simon Fraser University. These markets are, a lot of them are illegal, and so they're not well regulated. This is a really um, dangerous combination if we're looking at disease, uh, microbes, pathogens, jumping species. It's a perfect opportunity to do that. The Chinese government released these videos, supposedly showing the COVID-19 virus being fought by an elaborate campaign to spray airplane exteriors and fumigate entire cities. There are a lot of videos like this, of this mysterious fogging machine spraying God knows what all over the place. I can't think of any substance you could spray on an open street um, in the manner that's depicted that would have any impact on a virus at all. So it's very hard to understand what besides public relations was the point. On January 28th, the Director General of the WHO, the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, came to Beijing for a personal meeting with President Xi Jinping. At that time, China was reporting 4,537 cases of infection from COVID-19. An independent assessment in the Lancet Medical Journal estimated that as of January 25th, there were 75,800 in the city of Wuhan alone. But Dr. Tedros bent over backwards to praise China's handling of the outbreak. You have started uh, serious uh, public health measures. And this is very, very important and really we're proud that. He has to work with the government and he has to ensure that lines of communication remain open. So his words um, were to um, ensure that, you know, the Chinese relations remained positive. At the Tedros Xi Jinping meeting, the Chinese government reportedly insisted that the WHO delay any proclamation of a global health emergency, and Dr. Tedros complied. I believe indeed that WHO has been following the right procedural uh, in terms of responding to uh, the outbreak, and although I do believe that uh, they could have acted early. Look, WHO has been through this game before with the exact same country. The index of suspicion ought to have been much higher. We have a WHO that we've, you know, created collectively, that we've given limited resources to and limited powers. And we're now expecting it to do things that we, it was never designed to do. Um, it's not a global health SWAT team. It turns out that Chinese authorities have six times changed the method used to tabulate infected people which has medical experts around the world now doubting the value of their official figures. When you started seeing this long period where the numbers either didn't budge or even on one day went backwards, to me that just looked like completely fabricated figures. 
I hope the Chinese government, you know, not just the central government, but also the local government as well, uh, truly uh, draw the lessons from the outbreak and taking uh, measures to improve the transparency and openness, you know, to uh, uh, make sure that this time the same tragic is not going to happen again. I'm very nervous that as everybody is now returning from the lunar holiday extension, and eventually starts going back to work and back to school, that we're going to see a resurgence, a sort of, you know, epidemic number two. Gabriel Leung, who's an epidemiologist in Hong Kong, has predicted that this actually could end up infecting 65% of all human beings on Earth. Scientists are still figuring out the death rate, which appears to be much higher in China than outside it. But they say that even if this outbreak is contained, we need to quickly learn the lessons from it. With millions of people on international flights every day, it is likely only a matter of time before the world faces a truly global pandemic. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. Next, they are often on the front lines of human trafficking. We're there as hotel workers learn from a survivor. I was trafficked all the way from Ottawa to Toronto. The signs to watch for and how awareness is spreading well beyond hotel walls. And later, a surprise on live television for the Zamboni Go. We're there as his family watches, and we'll be right back. Human trafficking is one of the fastest growing criminal activities in Canada, and one of the most damaging, too. Its victims, mostly women, often underage. This past week on The National, we've explored the battle against traffickers through the eyes of survivors and police. Tonight, Joanna Romiliotis looks at how the hotel industry is being enlisted in the fight. So those are some things that front desk staff can look out for. The warning signs are stark when you know them. One of the biggest things is actually refusing housekeeping. So, you know, constantly having that do not disturb sign on. Another huge one is a major demand for a lot of towels and new bedding. At a Hilton hotel in Ajax, Ontario, staff are learning how to spot the signs of human trafficking and what they can do to disrupt it. If it's an emergency, call 911. But the best thing that you can do is just be kind enough to this individual. The majority of human trafficking occurs in hotels. Police operations like this one in Durham region are about making contact with potential victims. The vast majority are young, often underage and female, manipulated and coerced into the sex trade. It's why victim services of Durham region tell hotel staff victims often can't speak freely or seem disoriented. I was trafficked all the way from Ottawa to Toronto. Samantha Banducci was trafficked by her boyfriend. She says even just a kind word from a hotel employee would have been helpful. And I think that those things are helpful, not necessarily getting in somebody's face, but kind of standing in the background just saying, I'm here if you need me. Scene two, beta, take two, mark. Raising awareness is a priority in Durham. A public service announcement was recently produced and is now online. And beyond the region, Hospital emergency rooms across the country are training frontline staff to identify victims. So are truckers in the U.S. and Canada who may spot victims at rest stops. 911. As for hotels, several chains are also boosting in-house training as the demand for accountability grows. Lawyers claim that several local hotels helped sex traffickers. In, in the U.S., control. dozens of lawsuits have been filed against hotels for turning a blind eye and profiting from human trafficking. In Durham, police and victim services say hotels are a key partner and the majority are on board. Workers here say they're glad to know more. All the other staff here, we are all over the hotel. So there's things that we see that we don't really recognize or understand. And how does this change that? It's an eye-opener. And knowing what to look for is the first line of defense. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Ajax, Ontario. And Joanna also met another human trafficking survivor. Carly Church now works with police to save others. 
whether she's doing it independently or if she's being trafficked, um, she now knows that there's a resource that can um, offer other options. They took Joanna to the front lines of the battle against trafficking. You can watch that story on our website or on the Nationals YouTube page. When we come back, a life-changing weekend for the family of a Zamboni driver turned NHL star. I just think it's amazing for him. He's right. They share their experience as dad bends time and stretches his incredible 15 minutes of fame. We'll be right back. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, we unpack the sex crimes conviction of disgraced movie mogul Harvey Weinstein. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Pretty safe to say David Ayer's life has changed in the past 48 hours. The 42-year-old who survived a kidney transplant has now lived his dream of playing in the NHL. Ali Chiesson spoke with his family about dad's newfound fame. Low get up there by James Reimer. So the Carolina Hurricanes starting goalie goes down. Okay, this is the same old song and dance, right? This is just life as a backup, backup goalie. Okay, go get your stuff, make your way down to the truck because he keeps his equipment in the truck. Over there just part of the routine for David's wife, Sarah. And I'll just go pick him up after the game and whatever, everything will be how it always is, and we'll head home, get home by 10.30. But then the backup one, goalie gets hit and injured. And he's not getting up. It just honestly felt like when they say you zone into something and everything, all the noise around you stops, that was completely what it was. How about this moment? Oh, my goodness. What could be going through your mind right now? And Next thing you know, your husband's on the ice. I actually grabbed the guy beside me who I don't even know, and... I said to him, I'm like, that's my husband. And that's when the heir's lives changed. He led in two goals but made eight saves. If you've been on social media or watched the news in the last 48 hours, you know the rest. David Ayers, the Zamboni goalie as he's being billed, has made appearances on SportsCenter, on Fox and Friends. Here he is getting stopped by TMZ. Any, any word on a tryout for another team maybe? You want to... uh, who knows? I gotta go back to the emergency goalie for Toronto. His family watched his appearance on the Today Show. That one had a special guest, his mom, who is also his kidney donor. Your dad and I always said that you would get and uh, get where you are today. Come and on, it, Mom. It's, amazing. <laughs> it's been crazy with all the stuff that's been going on. He hasn't been home lately. Um, I just think it's amazing for him. But the attention at school has been pretty fun for his three kids. And some people actually came up to me and told me about how I was famous and everything. Has it sunk in for you? I don't, I don't really know. Faces a shot, makes the save. The guy at the game, he said to me, he's like, uh, you're married to an NHL player. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's, he's a superstar to us no matter what. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Bowmanville. Yeah, I guess that's cool. Uh, okay, to Los Angeles now, where emotions did run very high as thousands gathered to celebrate the life of Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and the seven others killed in a helicopter crash last month. When Kobe Bryant died, a piece of me died. And as I look in this arena and across the globe, a piece of you died. It was a star-studded crowd, including dozens of former and current NBA greats, along with members of the Bryant family. As we go to break, here's part of his wife, Vanessa's heartfelt goodbye to her late husband and her daughter. God knew they couldn't be on this earth without each other. He had to bring them home to heaven together. Babe, you take care of our Gigi. And I got Nani, Bibi, and Coco. We're still the best team. May you both rest in peace and have fun in heaven until we meet again one day. A forestry accident a century ago took Alan Menzies' leg, but that accident gave him something too, an idea for a business making prosthetics. Well, that idea endured three generations of his family ended up working for that company, Menzies & Sons, and today 
They celebrated their 100th anniversary, and their milestone is our moment. Try to get some people together and celebrate this milestone. It's uh, not every day you get to be 100 years old. I'm the oldest living amputee that Menzies has. They're a major part of my life. The limb that I have now is my fifth in a period of 78 years. Starting from being a six-year-old on crutches for 10 years, getting an artificial leg was an enormous step ahead. We had the very fortunate uh, occurrence to meet uh, Terry Fox. I think I worked on uh, 10 different uh, legs of his, got to meet him twice. You develop these relationships with patients and, uh, you know, they're not patients, they're friends. <laughs> And it, this is an amazing business. I mean, if you think about it in a century, all of the economic ups and downs they had to go through. Sure, um, yeah. they, they talk about during the Depression, it, they, there'd be bartering. So a prosthetic leg in exchange for, you know, apples or pears or <laughs> right. a barrel of potatoes or in one case, a 12-gauge shotgun. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, the, I mean, the economic change, just the technological change right. alone, right, from what would have been these unwieldy prosthetic limbs to the smart technology today. Uh, that's The National for this February 24th. Have a great night. Good night.